Welcome again to Inspiration, the Bible's Greatest Stories. Welcome. We're glad you're here in the Las Vegas area. Thank you for coming out this evening. We've just had a wonderful time looking at some beautiful Bible stories and discovering how that the gospel is presented through the stories of the Bible. So we're going to be looking at a very important passage found in the New Testament this evening. So we are glad you are here. I want to welcome those who are joining us online across the country and around the world. Also those watching on the various television networks, welcome. Thank you for being a part of this international Bible study. Now we do have a free offer we need to tell you about. For those of you who are here, you will receive this on your way out. It is a book entitled, The Two Witnesses. Now you read about the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11. And folks often have questions about who are the two witnesses? What do they do? Well, the book will explain what the Bible has to say about the two witnesses. It's free. We'll give it to you on your way out. For our friends who are watching online, if you'd like to receive this, just text the word witnesses to 40544 if you're in North America. If you're outside of North America, you can just visit the website greateststories.org and you'll be able to get a digital copy of the book. And I hope that you'll read it and then share it with somebody else because they'll also be blessed. Well, we have a theme song that we like to sing each evening. It's about the Word of God. It's called Wonderful Words of Life. I'd like to invite the musicians to come, and I hope you'll join me as we sing together, as well as those who are watching online. Join us as we sing. open up the Word, we always want to have the Holy Spirit help guide us. The Bible is God's book. The Holy Spirit inspired the prophets of old who wrote the Bible. So we need to ask God's Spirit to be with us. Let's just pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the opportunity once again to be able to open up your Word and study some wonderful, precious truths in Scripture. So bless our time together, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I've been so blessed to have Pastor Doug share with us over these past few evenings. And I know tonight, very exciting topic, you will be blessed. Pastor Doug, thank you so much for sharing with us. Tonight, we're going to be talking about, well, I better not Mount say. Of <laughs> <laughs> the Mount of Glory. It's a New Testament story, mm -hmm. and it involves two heavenly visitors. But that's all I'm going to say, right? right? We're going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Pastor Doug. He could preach any one of these messages himself. <laughs> 
So we're so glad to see each of you. You folks have been so faithful. Pastor Ross and I were talking to each other, and, and often when we go out of town, we do a week-long series like this. Sometimes middle of the week, folks forget you're there. But here in Las Vegas, bless your hearts. You've been very faithful, and we sure appreciate it. Again, want to thank the hosting church here, and uh, want to welcome those who are watching on AFTV or 3ABN, uh, Good News Network, and uh, Roku, YouTube, Facebook, and we have thousands that are joining us in this study. And tonight's subject about the mountain of glory is one of my favorite. Well, obviously, I've been sharing my favorites with you because, you know, that's the title, the Bible's greatest story. So we picked what I thought were the best stories in the Bible that had the most good theology that would be a blessing to us. And, and this truly is one of my favorites. I read it every time I find something new. It happened again today. And if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Mark. If you read, and we'll start with Mark chapter 9. And in Mark chapter 9, Jesus makes a very mysterious declaration. Now, you can find this not only in Mark 9, the same story is also in Matthew 17, Luke chapter 9. All three of the synoptic gospel writers realized that this was a very powerful, pivotal event in the life and ministry of Jesus and they recorded it. So, Jesus makes this statement, Mark 9, verse 1, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some of you standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God come with power. Some of you who are sitting here will not taste of death till you see the kingdom of God come with power. When he said that to the disciples, they thought, well, Jesus has been preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and we've been waiting for the kingdom of might to come in. They knew that Jesus had come to teach and to heal, but they wanted to see him come like uh, the son of David, a conquering king, destroy the Romans, make Israel a world empire again, and establish a, a physical, literal kingdom. And so they thought, oh, we're going to see the kingdom on earth. And so they were very excited about that. But nothing happened except for six days. Then something happened. All three Gospels, after he makes this statement, it then ties it in with the experience. The experience we're about to read about is the fulfillment of Jesus' cryptic statement. Assuredly, I say unto you, some of you standing here will not taste of death till you see the kingdom of God come or present with power. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and he led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves. Doesn't tell us what that mountain was. Uh, most think it's one of a couple of mountains there. It may have been Mount Hermon, from which the Jordan River flows, and there's another tall mountain about 4,000 feet in Israel. It doesn't say, but we can only guess. And he was transfigured before them. That word transfigured is metamorpho. It's where we get the word metamorphosis. And like when a butterfly goes from a worm to a butterfly. And uh, it's a, he was transformed before them. And his clothes became shining exceedingly white. Not just white, exceedingly white. Like no launder on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses. Now there's two other characters that suddenly appear. And they were talking with Jesus. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, because he didn't know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. And if that didn't scare them, then a cloud came and overshadowed them, a cloud of glory, and a voice came out of this cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Hear him. It's the same voice they heard there when Jesus was baptizing, saying that this is my beloved son and whom I am well pleased. Here he says, hear him or listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around after sh shaking and cowering, suddenly they looked around. They saw nobody anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. Now we'll pause there and well, actually, I'm going to read a little further. As they're going down the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one the things that they had seen till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. 
All right. With that, that's our story. What is happening here and why is it happening? This is one of the most remarkable stories in the Bible where uh, Jesus, He not only gives us an insights into His second coming, and we'll get to that in a moment, but you might say that this is um, the ultimate endorsement in that Jesus is being endorsed by Moses and Elijah that He is the Son of God, He is the Messiah, He is the Christ, He is the one that they've been waiting for. Not only Moses and Elijah, God Himself. And so this is an extremely important event that transpires shortly before the cross. So why did they go up the mountain? What was the reason for this trip? Well, you know, you can read in Luke 9. Now I'm jumping a little bit between Mark's account and Luke's account and Matthew's account. And if you read in Luke 9, it says, He took Peter, John, and James and went on. everything they read about Jesus, he was supposed to do something different. So he wants them to have an experience so no matter what happens, it'll sustain their faith through the trial that's coming. You understand? How are they going to get that? One thing, praying with Christ. Spending time praying. Praying for an experience that would sustain them. But instead of praying... What were they doing? Now, you don't see this in Mark, but now read what it says in Luke. Same story. Luke 9, verse 32, But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep. While Jesus is up there on the mountain praying that they might have a mighty experience, and he says, pray with me, what do they do? This is not the first time they went to sleep. And it wasn't the last time they went to sleep. You can read here, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and said, pray with me. And he was hoping they would have learned from this experience on the mountain. But while Jesus is praying, and he's praying in agony, the fate of the world hangs in the balance and they're sleeping. Jesus comes to him and he says, why do you sleep? Rise and pray lest you enter into temptation. So there's a crisis. You really need to pray in times. I mean, it's good to pray all the time. But we all agree that there are times of crisis when you really need to pray. When the king of Persia signed a decree that all of the Jews should be annihilated on a particular day, Esther proclaimed, along with her uncle Mordecai, three days of fasting and prayer for the Jewish nation because there was a crisis. By the way, we should be praying for what's happening in the world right now. And when they should be praying, what were they doing? They're sleeping. 
They're right there with Jesus and they fall asleep. You know, I think the devil has a special anesthesia. Or what is that what they call it? Where he try to put you to sleep? Anesthetizes the saints. You know, the Bible foretells Christ speaking of the second coming. He said, you know, Matthew 24, he talks about the second coming. Matthew 25, he then tells the parable of the ten virgins. We've talked about this. Five are wise, five are foolish, and what percent are asleep? 100% of them are sleeping. And when is this? Just before the bridegroom comes. You can read there in Matthew chapter 25, while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Now, many people think Christ should have come by now. And uh, they look at the signs of the times and they think, well, here we are about 2,000 years after the time of Christ. How, how come he hasn't come? And World War I, a lot of Christians said, this is it. World War II, especially after the atomic bomb, they said, this is it. And here we are, possibly on the cusp of World War III. And folks are going, oh, we've been through this before. And the church, at such an hour as you think not, Jesus said, the Son of Man comes. During the time of delay, an apparent delay, the Son of Man comes. They should be awake and instead they're sleeping when they should be praying. You know, sleep's really dangerous. Um, you fall asleep at the wrong time. A lot of people that die in house fires do not die from the fire. They die because they're asleep and they inhale the smoke and they never wake up. And it's not a good idea to go to sleep when you're driving. I was, I'm ashamed to tell you, I was traveling with the family. It was just Karen and I and our two youngest boys through New Mexico and, and uh, going to visit a mission that uh, we worked with. And, and uh, going down the road, they, they pour concrete slabs in the road there because it freezes up near Nagizi, New Mexico. And, and every 50 feet, you go ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. Well, you know, that starts to make you really relax after a while. And I'm driving along and there's, you can't get any radio reception and there's nothing going on. And then you're just hearing ka ching ka ching ka ching ka ching ka ching And I thought, I'm a man, I can fight it. And I tried to stay awake. And I thought, I didn't want to pull over. And uh, I could have asked Karen to drive, but that's scary too, she offered. <laughs> then I know I couldn't rest. <laughs> and she's actually a pretty good driver. But... Um, Anyway, all of a sudden, I heard bah, 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 because I, I drifted over into what they call the drunk bumps. And as soon as I realized, I just nodded for a second. You flinch awake, and I realized I am falling asleep. And I got my family in the car. And that could have ended very badly. And it scared me. And Karen heard the car go, bah, 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 bah. and she said, you okay? I said, I am now. <laughs> I said, I'm wide awake. It's, sleeping can be deadly, especially if God's people are sleeping right here on the verge of eternity when we ought to be praying. I heard about a civil, offense, civil defense official. He was making emergency shelter plans for the community. And he talked to the pastor and he said, in the event of an emergency, how many can you sleep in your church? And he said, well, I don't know about lying down, but I'm pretty certain that sitting in the pew, we can sleep about 800 because <laughs> we do it every week. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any of you ever have kids that are afraid to go to sleep at night? They fight sleep like it's something bad. You tell them it's bedtime. No, not that. And I can't help but wonder if when I was a kid, my grandparents taught me a prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I die before I wake, I was so afraid of going to sleep. <laughs> I think it was Tony Campola that says, instead of praying, if I die before I wake, we ought to say, Lord, wake me up before I die. <laughs> right? <laughs> and... Um, that's what we ought to be saying right now. Amen? That's what the church ought to be saying. Lord, wake us up before we die. We need to wake up. We studied the other day that the angel smote Peter to wake him up. Get him out of prison. And, you know, the, the light 
of the glory of God is so bright. And the Bible tells us that Jesus, I read it to you in Mark. Mark talks about how his clothes were so white that uh, any detergent company in the world would pay him a fortune for that secret. And you read it in Luke and it says, his face is shining like the brightness of the sun at midday. Or maybe that's Matthew. And that's what it says in Revelation 1 when it describes Jesus. When John sees Jesus in his glory, he's awed and terrified by the glory and majesty of God. The veil of divinity has been opened up and the humanity of Christ is now fading and they're seeing Jesus the divine and it is so bright that the light wakes them up. And um, they're just terrified by this. You read that happens to the prophets of God many times. Daniel chapter 10, Daniel sees God in his glory. I turned my face toward the ground and I became speechless. Isaiah, this holy prophet, he saw the glory of God and he said, woe is me, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. Ezekiel sees God in his glory. Ezekiel 128, when I saw it, I fell on my face. And John, when he saw the glory of Jesus in Revelation, it says, I fell down like one dead. The Roman soldiers guarding the tomb, when that angel came, they fell down as though they were dead. And if you wonder why God doesn't appear right now visibly to us, it's because he loves us, it would kill us. We couldn't handle it. So here Jesus is revealed in all his glory. So they see that. They should have no doubt now that he's got the glory of God. He wants them to know that. He wants them to see who he really is in this experience so they'll never forget. But why Moses and Elijah? You know, these are two very interesting characters. By the way, last prophecy in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4 and I believe if you start with verse 4, it says, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him for all Horeb, on Mount Sinai, with its statutes and judgments. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he'll turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Remember the law of Moses. Behold, I send you Elijah. You turn the page, you're in the New Testament. It's the last prophecy in the Old Testament. Now you turn the page, who appears? Moses and Elijah appear to point to Jesus and say, he is the one. Now, do people die and go right to heaven before the resurrection and the judgment? Not most people. Most people, Jesus said, our friend Lazarus is asleep and he'll rise in the, uh, Martha said, I knew he will rise in the last day. There's a resurrection when Jesus comes that says the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout for Thessalonians chapter 4. The voice of the archangel, the trump of God and the dead in Christ will rise when the Lord comes. Amen? Amen? And so most of the dead, it's like it says in the typical Christian graveyard, R.I.P. Rest in peace until the resurrection. Now if you're a believer and you die, your next conscious thought is the presence of the Lord. Right? But you know, time might be going by for us here on earth, but not for you. Because for you, there's no consciousness of time. You're there at the resurrection, caught up to meet the Lord in the air. But that hasn't happened yet because the judgment hasn't happened yet, right? But how did Moses get there? There are three exceptions in the Bible that we know about. No, there's a little more than that. Let me explain. Who's the oldest man that ever lived? Oh, yeah. People say Methuselah. Methuselah is the oldest man who ever died. It's a trick question. Enoch is the oldest man who ever lived because he's still alive. That's the father of Methuselah. The Bible says he walked with God and he was not for God took him. And then how is it that Moses got to heaven? You read in the book of Jude, verse 9, it says, Michael came, disputed with the devil over the body of Moses and said, the Lord rebuked thee and he brought not against him any railing accusation. So Moses was resurrected. And that's even in Jewish tradition, not in the Bible, but it's in a Jewish writings called the Assumption of Moses that three days later the Lord raised Moses. And so we know it's true because Moses appears to Jesus in the New Testament. What about Elijah? Elijah did not die. We're talking about this tomorrow. The Bible tells us that he was miraculously taken to heaven with that chariot of fire. So why Moses and Elijah? Enoch's not there. Moses and Elijah are the epitome of the great lawgiver, Moses. And Elijah, the greatest 
prophet. They represent the law and the prophets that have come to endorse that Jesus is the Messiah. There are several verses on that. Matthew 5, verse 17. Do not think I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. See, when Christ referred to the Scriptures, and you know, when Jesus first talked about the Scriptures, the New Testament wasn't written yet because that was written about Him after He ascended to heaven. So He's talking about the writings of Moses and the prophets, and that was summarized in Elijah and Moses. Luke 16, verse 31, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded that one should rise from the dead. When Christ rises from the dead, He says in Luke chapter 24, verse 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures. You got it? Moses prophet, all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. When he wanted to summarize all the scriptures, what did he say? Moses and the prophets. And Elijah is the great prophet who ascended to heaven. Moses is the great lawgiver. Now granted, there are other prophets that give law. There were other lawgivers in the Bible and other prophets, but they were the epitome of it. You might say not only do they represent the Word of God, the Word of God is often presented in a dual nature in the Bible. And it says uh, it's like they're the two witnesses that talk about God. Revelation 11, and I'll give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. And many scholars believe this is a symbol for the Word of God. In the mouth of two witnesses, let everything be established. The law and the prophets are those two witnesses. The Bible is called a sword with how many edges? Two. two. Revelation 1.16. In his right hand are seven stars and out of his mouth. Speaking of Jesus, out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword. Now, I mean, I hope you all know that's a symbol. When Jesus comes, we really don't want to see him with a big sword sticking out of his face, right? These are symbols talking about what's in Jesus' mouth. The Word of God. He was the Word of God incarnate. What kind of sword? Two-edged sword. Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets are symbolized by this. One more, Hebrews 4 verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. I'll give you a couple more for free. Isaiah 8 16, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. What is the testimony? Revelation chapter 19 verse 10 says, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Isaiah 8.20, to the law and the testimony. That's the law and the prophets. That's what that means. So all through the Bible, Moses and Elijah represent the Word of God. Now, something's very interesting about these um, two men appearing so that Peter, James, and John could see them, and they're talking to Jesus. They represent the ultimate endorsement. You know, when you're in an election season, and different candidates are trying to get voters. They think if, if the voters don't know who I am, if I can get the endorsement of someone they trust, and they try to find the most visible, popular, trustworthy people to endorse the various candidates. And uh, it's kind of surprising to me sometimes who they pick to endorse them. It's just like, you know, they try and get some rock group to endorse them or something. But um, the idea is you get more credibility through good endorsements. You know, I wrote, um, I've written a few books. And one of the books I spent the most time on was a book called At Jesus' Feet. And um, some of you remember a televangelist named George Vandeman. He started the It Is Written program. And I was able to send one of my books to him and said, uh, Brother George, he was friends of Karen and I, I said, could you look through this and maybe do an endorsement? Nobody knows who in the world I am, but it might help if I get an endorsement from you. And he was kind enough to do that. Um, but when I wrote the second book, Brother George was gone. So I sent it to the publishers, and there was an endorsement in the front of the book. It said, this book by Doug Batchelor at Jesus' feet is the most wonderful exposition of Mary Ma Magdalene this millennium, Billy Graham. Nice. Now, I got a call from the publishers when they saw that, and they said, Doug, how in the world did you get this endorsement from Billy Graham? I said, well, he hasn't read it yet, but I'm going to ask him, and I think this is what he's going to write. <laughs> there was a little joke between me and the publisher, see if I can get their attention. <laughs> Never did get that endorsement. <laughs> Karen, I did go and see Billy Graham once, but we never did get him to read the book. 
But um, so th this is what's happening here is if you're a Jew and everybody's wondering, there are many false Christs before Jesus and after Jesus. You can read about it in the book of Acts, the Sanhedrin saying, oh, there have been many false Christs already. So how is Jesus going to show them that he wasn't just one of these other false Christs? What's the best endorsement he could get? The, the epitome of the scriptures in the endorsement of Moses and Elijah. The only other one you might add is maybe Abraham. I remember hearing a story one time, you know, during uh, some elections, um, because there are, I don't know, 50 million Catholics in North America, whoever's running for office likes to get the Pope's endorsement, or at least a kind word. He usually doesn't endorse outright, but sometimes a kind word, and it influences votes. And uh, it's interesting that every president seems to fly to the Vatican and meet the Pope. But um, several years ago, I heard a story where Pope John Paul II was visiting North America, and this is before he had his Pope mobile. And he was in Napa, California, and they had flown all night with their entourage to San Francisco, and they went up to Napa, and there was some buddy he was going to meet with. And, and he woke up, you know, you're, you got jet lag, you wake up in the middle of the night, and uh, he woke up his chauffeur, he said, let's go for a drive. And the chauffeur said, oh, no, your holiness, not in the schedule. No, no, no. He said, look, I'm the Pope. Oh, let's go. We'll go for a drive. There's not, nothing. It's a beautiful country here. So finally, reluctantly, the chauffeur gets dressed and they get in their, their limousine, you know, with the darkened windows. And the Pope sits in the back and he's driving up the Silverado Trail there in Napa to look at all these beautiful vineyards. And the, the, the Pope wants to look, but the windows are kind of darkened. And so he rolls down the window and the chauffeur protests, no, 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 your holiness, because he's got his, you know, robes on, his little white cap, and what do people see him? And he's making a big fuss, and the Pope says, pull over. He finds a wide spot, he pulls over. Pope gets out of the car, walks over to the chauffeur, says, I want to drive. Oh, no, 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 I'll be in a lot of trouble, Mamma Mia, you can't do that. And he says, no, he says, I used to drive all the time before I was Pope. I was just a priest. I drove all the time. I can drive. And here in California, they drive on the same side of the road as in Poland. I can do it. And the chauffeur, no, 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 no. He said, look, I'm the Pope. You want to get excommunicated? Get in the back. <laughs> right now, that's an order. Get in the back. And so this poor chauffeur, he's, oh, no, no, no. And he, he gets in the back and the Pope gets around. He fiddles and finds the controls and he presses the window and he closes it off so he doesn't need to listen to him anymore. And he pulls out and he starts to drive up the Silverado Trail and he's just beginning to enjoy himself. And the windows aren't darkened because, you know, it's the drivers you have to be able to see. And uh, he misses a stop sign. <laughs> and there was nobody there. It wasn't that dangerous except for the sheriff that was parked at the intersection. <laughs> and he pulls out behind the Pope and turns on his lights. He's following his limousine. And um, Pope knows what that means. He pulls over and he sits there with the car idling and his hands on the steering wheel. Sheriff comes over, taps on the window. Pope rolls down the window, looks at him. Sheriff looks at him, says, I'll be right back. <laughs> he goes over to his car and he radios back to the dispatch and says, patch me into the captain. We got a situation. And the captain says, what's up? He says, yeah, they, I've got something going on here. It's a little unusual. He said, I've just pulled over someone and they're a VIP and I'm not sure how we're supposed to deal with this. He said, well, what'd you do? You pull over the mayor of Napa? He said, no, he's more important than the mayor of Napa. <laughs> so what'd you do? You pull over Governor Schwarzenegger? <laughs> he said, no, I think he's more important than Governor Schwarzenegger. So what'd you do? Pull over the president? Who'd you pull over? He said, I don't know who I pulled over. All I can tell you is the Pope is his driver. So, who do you get that even is more important than Moses and Elijah? Not only do Moses and Elijah talk to Jesus, God the Father speaks. Now, can you go above that? You ever say, let me speak to the manager, the one in charge? He is the one in charge. And he says, if you don't believe Moses and Elijah, this is my son. Hear him. The voice of God from the heavens. If you ever have any question that Jesus was the Christ, you've not only got the testimony of the four 
writers of the Gospels, you've got the testimony of Moses and Elijah, and you've got the testimony of God Almighty, that Jesus is the one. Now, have you ever wondered, how did the disciples know that it was Moses and Elijah? They had no video back then. They didn't go online and say, sure enough, that's Moses. They could, there was no pictures. They obviously heard them talking, and Jesus is addressing them by name. And um, what were they talking about? This is why I like comparing one gospel with the other. Mark didn't say it, but Luke did. It tells us in, what are they discussing? Luke 9.31, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he would accomplish at Jerusalem. What is Moses and Elijah talking to Jesus about? Or what are they talking about? His death, his sacrifice that would happen in a few weeks. Now that was brilliant on the part of the Lord, which is a silly thing to say because God only does brilliant things. But uh, for him to send Moses and Elijah, think about this. Stay with me. How does anybody get to heaven? Is anybody saved by their good works? No. no. Um, what's the penalty for sin? Death. Death. How many have sinned? Oh. Everybody, including Moses? And Elijah. Penalty for sin is death. How can they go to heaven? We can only be saved by the sacrifice of Jesus. Are you with me? Has Jesus died yet? But they're in heaven. All right. Any of you, you don't have to raise your hands. Did you ever work and you found out that you had more months than paycheck? And you've gone to your boss and said, Can I get an advance? The only way I need know how to explain this theologically is to tell you that they got an advance on the sacrifice Jesus was going to make. You, there's no other way that you can say that they earned heaven or they got in without the blood of Jesus. Because you can't get to heaven without the blood of Jesus. He's the one who paid for the sins of Moses and Elijah. But he hasn't died on the cross yet. So, can you imagine how that conversation went? Moses says, Lord, we know what it's like to be unappreciated by your own people. Did Moses know? They wanted to stone him. Elijah knew. He had to hide. They were trying to kill him. They said, we understand, Lord. And Lord, we really like it up here. <laughs> and if you don't go through with this, uh, not only will a lot of people be lost, but we can't stay. Who could be more motivated? Moses had been there, oh, over a thousand years and Elijah 600 years when this happened. Who would be more motivated to encourage Jesus to go all the way? Don't get discouraged. You ever think that Jesus needed encouragement? Why did Jesus say, come pray with me to the apostles? Was Jesus human? Did he appreciate the, the companionship of others and the support of others? And so they spoke to him regarding his decease he was about to accomplish. And then it's interesting that um, something else about Moses and Elijah. There are three people in the Bible that have fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Who are they? Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. They were all on the mountain that day. There are three people in the Bible where God took the Spirit from them and gave it to others. You read in the Old Testament, God took the spirit of Moses and put it on the 70 elders. God takes the spirit of Elijah and gives it to Elisha. And Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to the apostles at Pentecost. On the mountain that day, you've got the three people who lived during the three temples in the Bible. Peter said, let's build three temples. He didn't know what he was saying, but whether he knew it or not, it was prophetic. And, and Peter's wrong. We shouldn't make a temple and worship Moses, and we shouldn't make a temple and worship Elijah. We should only worship Jesus. But it is interesting to know that there was one temple in the Bible during the time of Moses. The second temple was there during the time of Elijah, Solomon's temple. That was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. The third temple was in existence during the time of Jesus. Three stages to salvation. Justification is what Moses represents. They came out of Egypt because of the lamb. 
the Passover lamb. Sanctification, Elijah brought the people back to God in life of holiness there on Mount Carmel. Glorification, Moses was on Mount Sinai. Elijah went through the wilderness and he went to Mount Sinai. And of course, Jesus, he was the great lawgiver who spoke to them on Mount Sinai. Yeah, I could go on and on and talk about the interesting parallels between Moses and Elijah and Jesus. So, you've got those three temples, justification, sanctification, and Jesus' glorification. They all fought for uh, sanctification and revival in the Bible. Now, this is where it gets really exciting. After Jesus says, some of you are standing here who will not taste of death until you see the kingdom of God come with power. He says that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's almost identical. Then it says he waits six days before their fulfillment. Why did he wait six days? Why did they even record six days? I thought about that and I thought, there's nothing in the Bible by accident. After Jesus says, you're going to get a picture of the second coming. See, when he took them up the mountain, that was a microcosm of the second coming that Peter, James, and John got to experience. Was Jesus glorified? Will Jesus come in the glory of the Father? On the mountain, he was in the glory of the Father. No doubt there were angels around. They may have even heard angelic music. Moses, he died, but he is resurrected. Elijah did not die. He is translated. There's two kinds of people going to heaven when Jesus comes. The ones who are resurrected and those of us who are alive and remain that will be caught up like Elijah to meet the Lord in the air. I want to be one of those, don't you? Amen. When the Lord comes. I mean, if I die and I'm saved, I'm happy, but I'd rather avoid it if I can. <laughs> right? And so they represent the classes of people that will be going back to heaven with Jesus. And he's coming in the glory of the Father. There you've got the declaration of the Father. This is my beloved Son. It is a miniature picture of the second coming where Christ is surrounded by clouds of angels as he was surrounded by the clouds of glory there on the mountain. But he said after six days he took them up. And I started thinking about it. You know, the Bible says, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, thinking of the second coming, one day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. A day is like what? A thousand years. God said to Adam, you eat the forbidden fruit in the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. How long did Adam live? 930 years. And even Enoch, who made it to 969, no man ever made it to the one millennium mark. Of course, yeah, Enoch had made it, but he didn't die. In the day you eat thereof, you will die. Adam and Eve died in that first millennial day. If you're created to live forever, what's a millennium? Nothing, right? And they began to die spiritually that very day that they disobeyed. The other thing is, when you add up the dates in the Bible, why don't you just add the ages? Now, I just want to make something very clear. I am not going to go anywhere near setting a time for Christ's coming because nobody knows the day and the hour. If anybody tells you they know the day and the hour, stop listening to them because I've seen a lot of people have lost faith in the last few years because prominent preachers say they figured it out and then the day comes and goes and people say you can't trust the Bible and the world mocks Christians to do that. But can we know when the time is near? We can Jesus said, you can tell the weather by looking at the sky. How come you cannot discern the signs of the times? So, with that in mind, the time for creation is approximately 6,000 years ago. What I mean by that is, you know, it tells us how long Adam lived. It tells us how long Seth lived and all the ancestors all the way up to Abraham. You can look in the New Testament genealogy of Luke chapter 3. It traces Jesus all the way back to Adam. Have you seen that before? traces Jesus all the way back to Adam. You also see it in Matthew, except Matthew does it back to uh, David. He doesn't go all the way back to Adam. Or he may actually go back to Abraham. So here you've got the genealogies of Jesus. You add up the dates. The first 2,000 years of Christian history is the age of the patriarchs. That's Adam, Enoch, Methuselah, Noah. Then 2,000 years Later, Abraham is born. Now you have the age of the Jews for 2,000 years. 2,000 years later, Jesus is born. Now you have the age of the church or spiritual Israel, whatever you want to call it. And here we are living right now 
approximately 6,000 years or six days. After six days, he took them up. Are you hearing me? And how long do we spend in heaven resting, living and reigning with the Lord? A thousand years. God's got a pattern through the Bible. You work six days, you rest one. Some people have problems with that. But I didn't write it, friends, so take that up with the Lord. It's, it's in the Bible. <laughs> now look at the parallels in the Bible. Exodus 21. If you have a Hebrew servant, he'll serve you six years. At the end of six years, in the seventh year, he goes free. The Bible tells us when Jesus comes, it's going to be like a jubilee and the captives are set free. Amen? Amen. How long was Moses on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments? Forty days and forty nights, right? Kind of like the reign of Noah. But before he went up the mountain, did you ever catch this verse? Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it for six days. How long? And at the end of six days, God called to Moses from the clouds and he went up. After six days... They went up. Lots of stories like this. You know, it was after going around the city of Jericho six times, or rather, after going around, yeah, the city of Jericho uh, once for six days, then on the seventh day, they went around the city seven times and the city fell. They took possession of the promised land after those six days of circling the city on the seventh day. Six years you shall sow your land and gather in the fruit thereof. Exodus 23, verse 10. But the seventh year, you leave it fallow. The land is desolate. Don't farm it. You know, when the children of Israel, they didn't obey that law. They often said, oh, we can't afford to. And they neglected it. God carried them off to Babylon. And he said, you're going to be in Babylon for 70 years. You know why? He said that the land might be desolate and enjoy its Sabbaths. For the condition of the world during the millennium is a desolate condition. And it's keeping Sabbath. And then God's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. Are you with me, friends? Are you catching this? There's another story. 2 Kings 11, verse 3. You probably heard of um, Queen Jezebel, wicked queen. She had a daughter that was just as bad. Her name was Athaliah. She had married the king of Judah. And when her son, Ahaziah, died in battle, Queen Athaliah didn't want one of her grandsons to rule over her. They were the descendants of David. She was the granddaughter of a pagan Baal king. Athaliah, she went to annihilate all of her grandchildren. That's cold-blooded because I'll tell you, I used to think the strongest earthly attraction was you've got, you know, a man for his wife, then parents for their children. But sometimes I think the love of a grandparent for its child is even stronger. My mother-in-law just said amen. <laughs> <laughs> Not only is Karen here, but Bonnie, Bonnie, stand up. Wave your hand, Bonnie. I'm going to come over there. Pick your hand up. There's your hand. <laughs> That's Karen's mom, who is also my administrative secretary for the last 27 years. So anyway, but the love, she just spoils the kids rotten. Love of a grandparent towards the child. Athelai killed her grandchildren. Talk about cold-blooded. But one escapes. His name is Joash. His aunt sneaks him out of the palace and hides him in the temple of the Lord for six years. He's the son of David in the temple of the Lord for six years. At the end of six years, Jehoiada the high priest says, we can't hide him anymore. It's time to crown him. They bring him out. They blow the trumpets as the trumpets will blow when Jesus comes out. Where's our Savior right now? Isn't he at the right hand of God in the temple of heaven? Is he coming with a trumpet? They blew the trumpets. The people shouted. King Joash was coronated. Athaliah was slain. That's what you read in Revelation. Babylon, the mystery, the harlot is slain. Jesus is crowned. The trumpets blow. It's a repeat of history in these stories, friends. When does it happen? After six. The kingdom changes. So when I read this, after six days, he says, some of you are going to see a miniature of the second coming. He could have done it after two days or ten days. This is after six days he took him up. I can't help but wonder if God is telling us that his coming is soon. But you see, well, Pastor Doug, 2,000 years past the birth of Jesus would be 1996 roughly because he was probably born around 4 B.C. I know that messes with people, but after they picked the A.D. 
BC dating method, they found out they were off a couple of years. Jesus was born. A, you know, the Bible says that King Herod tried to kill him. Herod the Great died in about 2 BC. And so Jesus was born before that. And so Jesus, you know, he, he was born, it's more than 2,000 years ago. But it's not more than 2,000 years from when Jesus lived or when he died. We are living, if you go back 2,000 years ago, right now Jesus was alive and teaching. No man knows the day or the hour. For one thing, it could be a little longer than you think because Peter tells us the Lord is long suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all might come to repentance. Second Peter chapter 3. It could be a little sooner than you think. Jesus said, For the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. I don't know when it's going to happen. But I see the signs of the times that I, I believe that we're living in that window. One thing I notice that it's at a time when it appears there's a delay. Let me give you a couple more stories real quick. Samuel the prophet tells King Saul, you're going to go fight against the Philistines. Wait for me. After seven days, I will come to you. But during the time of waiting, it looked like Samuel was delayed. And Saul said, I can't wait any longer. And Saul went and offered sacrifice instead of waiting for the priest. And he lost the kingdom. He was being tested during a time of of delay. God, I think, is going to be testing his people during a time of delay. Moses went up the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. He said, I'll come back. They said, when? He said, I don't know. I don't know the day or the hour. I've got to go get what God's given me and I'll come back. Just be ready. He went up there. You read that while Moses was up there, the people, it says quite literally, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming back, they said, let's make other gods. Let's pick another leader. God's church began to compromise during the time of delay. When Jesus talked about the second coming, listen to what he said. If that evil servant says in his heart, my Lord delays his coming and begins to eat and drink with the world and beat his fellow servants, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he's not looking for him and an hour he's not aware of. All these times when it's talking about the second coming, it talks about the church sleeping, it talks about a time of delay. We're living right now, friends, in that window where the church is wondering, is he ever coming back again? That's when you really need to sit up and pay attention. Amen. Now, why did Jesus take Peter, James, and John up on the mountain? Because they needed an experience that would prepare them for Calvary when their faith was going to be tested. Who do Moses and Elijah represent? The Word of God, right? The Law and the Prophets. It includes the Old and New Testament. It's the Word of God. The testimony of Moses, the testimony of Elijah, and Jesus brought them up there to pray. The way that we are going to be ready for what's coming, friends, is we need to have devotional lives. There's so much information out in the world that we are being bombarded with, but we're forgetting to spend time with Jesus. Jesus knew very soon he was going to be on another mountain. He was not going to be robed in glorious white robes. He was going to be stripped. There was not going to be angelic music coming from heaven. There was going to be the cursing of the mob. Jesus was not going to be flanked by Moses and Elijah. He was going to be flanked by two thieves. And then Peter, James, and John are going to go and get as far away from that mountain as they could because they were so afraid, just like they were afraid on the other mountain. Jesus was trying to prepare them for an hour of crisis that was coming, and he said the way to prepare is you need to get into the light. You need to follow Jesus up the mountain. You need to listen to his word. Spend time praying with him. So often we're sleeping when we ought to be praying. And building a relationship. Friends, if you knew the Lord better, you would love Him more. Amen. I promise you. If you love Him more, you will want to serve Him. You will serve Him better if you love Him more. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. You can't keep His commandments if you don't love Him. So how are we going to prepare for the crisis that's coming? And I don't know if you've seen the news, friends, but there's a crisis coming. It looks like the world is heading into political, economic, might even be terrorist crisis, could be nuclear problems people are talking about. Just It's frightening to think they're even using the words. I don't, I'm not afraid of any of that. 
I just want to know, Lord, is my life in your hands? We need to be feasting on the Word of God right now to prepare. Share a little amazing fact with you as we close. We have a little hummingbird feeder out behind our house. And you can ask Karen. It's, it's, I'm kind of fixated on it. Every time I walk by, I've got to look. I am so amazed at hummingbirds. Some birds, not so much. Hummingbirds, it's just intriguing to me. They can fly upside down and backwards and they just go, the little wings are buzzing all the time and they're iridescent in the sunlight and, and they're so delicate and so fast and they're fearless. They'll chase away. They chase me when I go to feed them. <laughs> you know, hummingbirds, they've got a very fast metabolism, one of the fastest in the animal kingdom. They've got to eat like every 20 seconds or uh, their blood sugar gets low. Well, every 10 minutes or so, I'm exaggerating. About every 10 minutes, they got to eat. And uh, they're constantly feeding. But there's once a year when millions of hummingbirds in North America, not all of them, but millions of them, migrate across the Gulf of Mexico, flying over the ocean 20 hours nonstop to get to Mexico, to get to the Yucan Peninsula, peninsula where they, they uh, winter down there and feast on the flowers down there. You know what they do before that trip? They gorge on nectar. The only way they're going to make it, they know they've got a gorge to get them through the storm. Friends, we're heading for a storm. How did Noah make it through the flood? He not only brought the animals, he stored the food for the animals. And the way that we're going to get through the coming storm is we need the promises of God in our mind. How did Jesus fight temptation? It is written, it is written, it is written. We need to hide God's word in our heart that we might not sin against him. Can you say amen? amen? We are so blessed, friends, to have Bibles in our hands. Karen and I went to Russia years ago where they had not had the Bible in 70 years and we brought Bibles with us. This is right after communism fell. And they were stroking their Bibles and their eyes were tearing up because they had not had their whole own Bible in their whole life. We don't, don't appreciate what a blessing we have, friends. We need to get on our knees every day and spend time in the Word of God on the mountain with Moses and Elijah and Jesus. Amen? Amen? In our story we read, there's seven individuals. You've got three on earth, Peter, James, and John. You've got three in heaven, Moses, Elijah, and God. And then you have one that was God and man that bridged heaven and earth. The cross is the bridge between heaven and earth, friends. Amen? That's the only way to get there is through Jesus. How many of you would like to say tonight, Lord, I want to spend time with Jesus on the mountain, getting to know you better through your word, the law and the prophets, and have a relationship to get through the coming storm and to share that good news with others. Let me pray with you as we close. Loving Father, we thank you for this very important message. Jesus is coming soon. The world's on the cusp of a great crisis now. Uh, now, as always, we need to know you better. Help us spend that time with you in your word. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, friends. We're so thankful that you've been here. When is our next meeting? It's really good study tomorrow night. We want to talk about how to be spirit-filled. Bring your friends. If you're here local, tell your friends to tune in. We'll see you then.